Thank you, Dora. And um, thank you also to the Malden Library. Really appreciate um, the opportunity and your interest in hearing about my work. Um, it's really fortuitous timing for me because I am opening a solo show at the Boston Sculptors Gallery a week from today. Uh, and so that was just a happy accident. And I also need to thank my good friend, Carolyn Muscat, who um, I think gave you my, gave uh, my name to you, Dora. And um, I'm following a hard act there because uh, Carolyn made a presentation last week and she was terrific. And I was inspired by how she started her talk. She showed a picture of her studio. This is uh, one room in our studio. Um, I run the Shepherd and Maudsley studio with my partner, um, Rebecca Lord Gardner. She's the, the Maudsley part. It's in West Newton. And I just thought you might be interested to see what we've got going on. We've got 6,000 square feet of makerspace, um, five presses, you know, lots of good stuff. Um, this is the biggest room where we have the three presses. And again, um, please interrupt with questions at any time. I'm, I'd rather um, have you, you know, ask questions as we go. I think we missed a, yeah. This is another space. Um, this is where we do a lot of our silk screening. I teach small silk screen classes in this room. Um, and um, this, we, we run small classes. Here's, this is Rebecca, uh, right over here, right there, um, teaching a, um, book class and um, we do classes, mostly small classes in um, all sorts of printmaking techniques, mono print and woodblock and silk screen, all sorts of things. Um, they're not all taught by Rebecca and I, we bring in guest teachers all the time. Um, and so that's just a taste of what we do. And you're welcome to come to see the studio any point um, by appointment. So I thought I would begin talking about my practice as a printmaker. I was trained classically with drawing and painting from life, the figure, landscape, still life. And I did that my whole, my whole life. I was, you know, born an artist. <laughs> uh, but when I got to the museum school in 1999 as a post-bac artist, my life completely changed. I had never done any printmaking. And um, at the museum school, it, it was just a sandbox for me. It really blew my mind how you don't have to major in anything. You just can do whatever interests you. And I thought, well, I'll take a printmaking class. Um, and I had never done any printmaking before. And I jumped in with woodblock. These, to give you a sense of scale, these, this is the size of these two blocks. They're about, the blocks are as big, you can see the block on the press. It's the biggest block that will fit on this press. And this second, this is the second of these two. Um, this print on the left is the one I've done pretty recently. The one on the right I did when I was a student at the museum school. And um, the, the thing, one of the things I learned, many, many things I learned at the museum school was this cute saying, which is if you can't make it good, make it big. And if you can't make it big, make it orange. <laughs> and so I was, I was really trying to play catch up because I was not a young person. I was uh, 45 years old, you know, getting into art school with all the kids who were really cool. And I felt like I really had to go big, you know, so I, I made these big wood blocks. But pretty soon, I, um, I heard about this thing called photo etching and also Photoshop. And um, someone did a demo of a photo etching at the, the school. And I thought that is really cool that you could take any image, any image and put it on a plate and make prints from it. And also the idea of appropriation was something that was brand new to me. And um, so, and when I learned how to do Photoshop, I realized that I could take bits and pieces from various things, put them together, um, customize them to my own liking and make something new. And that was for me, that unchained me from drawing from life, which I never really liked. And I felt like, you know, now that I'm a middle-aged lady, I can just stop doing some of these things that I never really liked doing anyway. I thought 
if I, if I was, I was never going to be the world's ba best painter because there are just, oh my God, the whole history of painting and, um, and drawing, you know, I thought Angelo was the best person who could possibly draw. And I, I knew I could, but I, I was trying to find my own voice. And I did this piece uh, at a time when there was illness in the family and I was trying to find a way to talk about it indirectly. And, um, oops, let me just, this, so just after I did that first one, I did this one, which is, um, oops, sorry, this is um, a very large plate. So this is a copper plate etching. It was the biggest plate they sold at the museum school. It was like close to 30 by 40 inches, which is about as big as I can lift. So again, I was just trying to go big, you know, but what this is, is I found a coloring book and it, it said C is for chair. And it was just a drawing of a chair. And so I scanned it. So that was sort of a new thing for me. And I just pasted it down on, uh, a, 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 you know, Photoshop and then just started copying and pasting, copying and pasting, copy, paste, you know, thousands of times to create this incredible stack of chairs and, um, and made it into a copper plate etching. And um, this was, a, this was a breakthrough for me to be able to talk about my feelings of being overwhelmed by what was going on in the world, mm -hmm. um, how I felt about my own life, you know, but in an indirect way. And I really wasn't thinking, you know, I was going to be a conceptual artist. Um, I wasn't thinking about surrealism. I was just doing something very intuitively. And from there, I was also trying to like learn about printmaking in a very bravado way, because at the museum school, you know, everything had to be like hard to do, you know, and this, so this is basically two, this one copper plate, but um, printed twice on thin paper and then overlaid. So it, it's called, mm. color. but you can see one layer through the other. Again, it's a quite big. And I, I actually drew these kettles in different positions all over each other. And, um, you know, there's a little bit, I think of Holocaust in the work, you know, about c catastrophe and chaos, um, those kinds of things. Um, and then at the mm -hmm. same time, I did this piece, which is actually a digital print. And um, I tried making it as an etching. I tried doing various things, silk screen, but it always came back to the fact that it was really, you know, sort of just a digital print. And, and this is, um, these are chairs that I actually drew in a CAD program. So 3D modeling program which I learned at the museum school. And so I made one chair and then I had to learn how to rotate the chair in space. And then it, you know, and this was right about 9-11. Um, about so for me, it was a way to talk about people falling out of buildings at, on 9-11. Mm. And um, the, the very kind people at the museum school made a poster of this and sent it to every high school in the country at the time. Mm. So it got a lot of play. Um, so got out of the museum school. It was the best time of my life. I graduated in 2006. And um, actually my entire thesis show was sculpture, which, and I'll show you a piece of that. Um, because again, they never asked me to say, I never had to choose between printmaking or sculpture or whatever. It just it ended up being sculpture. But this is a picture of me in Berlin. Um, we went to Berlin in January and um, I'm standing outside the Reichstag and just so cold. And I'm wearing like 4,000 layers of high-tech material and I was freezing standing in the cold. And my husband took a picture of me and I was, I was really experiencing what that was like to be in Berlin in January in that place. And it was, it was a, a very meaningful experience for me. And it started me on this series of, um, can you guys see all these pieces? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so this started me on a series of work that I call my immigrants. So there are pictures of, this is actually a, um, a silhouette of me. And I started appropriating 
um, tiny little parts of engravings. So I would um, appropriate an engraving, but you know, of an engraving that was maybe five by seven, I would take an area that was maybe a quarter of an inch by a quarter of an inch and use that piece um, as part of the figures. And I did a lot of these. I mean, they were, um, what we did was we reenacted me in that coat with that hat, with that bag in my studio. And my husband took pictures of me rotating in different positions. And then I made, I made just dozens of different etchings. These are copper plate etchings and the sheet is 22 by 30. So still like for, I never got the memo that etchings were supposed to be small. <laughs> I was like, if it's not 22 by 30, I just don't feel like doing it, doing it. So, I, and I think too, because of my hands being big or my gestures being big, you know, that, um, or me just trying to be attention grabbing, you know, I like to work big. So these are just two of those. And as the series has progressed over the years, the immigrant has changed too. And here I am, here's my immigrant figure, but in a completely, um, Another another engraving piece together, and and um, I became really interested in these gears that you see in the middle here. That that became another body of work which I'm going to show you. Um, there's something about those gears that really interested me. Hmm. So again, um, this I did pretty recently. This is a banner outside the Fuller Craft Museum that, unfortunately, I put it up and then it blew down in a big storm. So, oh. yeah, <laughs> but you know, here again is the immigrant and um, there's a picture of me for scale. And I thought it might be interesting for you to see how this kind of thing is made. Mm. And this is me with one of our um, shop techs, Isaac, printing silk screen. So what I did was I laid out this high tech fabric that could take the weather on a table that we have that you can pin fabric into. So it, it's for printing textiles, basically. Although we print big sheets of paper too. And um, so I laid out the fabric, I painted it yellow, and then I kind of like put a texture on it and then started um, printing the image modularly. So I, you know we don't have a 15 foot screen. So you have to do it in sections. And here I am printing one of those sections. What's the iron for? Oh yeah, the iron. <laughs> So if you have two people pulling a, a squeegee quite hard, if you don't weight it down, it's going ah. to move. So you can see my husband back there holding one side and then the iron is holding the other side. And then we have more iron so that it holds it down. I was doing printing on silk just recently. And as I pulled the squeegee, it slid across the silk. <laughs> mm. So this is what this banner looked like. Um, when I, you know, in production on that table. So I had to go through and print all of that pink color and then went back and printed the two grays on top. So you can imagine, I don't know how many times it's passed, but there's a lot of printing there. Are those considered plates or that's just passing within the same or are those different plates for each color? So those, that's a silk screen print. Oh, okay, sorry. So it's, a, so it's a different screen for each part of the image. So what we would, we have three or four of these big screens. And so what I do is put different parts of the image on the first three, print those three, wash those off, put different, it's a, it's a lot of back and forth. How do you align different uh, sections when you print them? Because it looks like it's seamless. It looks like it was just one. Yeah, I know. Um, well, that was a lot of trial and error at first. I'm going to show you some other work that was printed that way. And what I discovered when I started doing this, uh, and, I've, and I've done a lot of it, is that um, if you don't flood your screen, um, you just put the screen down, you can see through the screen. So you once you've printed one piece, you put the next piece on and you can see through it and adjust it visually. And so it's all done visually. It's, there's no um, like pin registration or anything like that. Mm. I'm just doing it by eye. And uh, I'm very fortunate to have, um, have had many wonderful young uh, printmakers who work with us as shop techs or, or interns. 
And sometimes I just use their young eyes, you know, I'll say like, does that look right? You know, and, and you make mistakes, you know, and you have to do things over and, you know. So this is, so basically I work in series. And this is another series, um, again, from a, some appropriated imagery. When I find the images, they often don't look anything like what I, they end up being. So this is the a diver and the image on the right is the diver, but he's being chased by arrows. So I photographed the arrows in my studio and then put it together with the, the diver. And I don't know, I think, I think what happened is my husband was looking for a job and I felt like it was tough out there. <laughs> That's what this was. I'm trying to dive into a full pool, you know, middle-aged person looking for a job. We have a chat. Carolyn says, I love these. Oh, the diver, Carolyn? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Those are those. Um, so the one on the left is a 22 by 30 etching. And the mm -hmm. one on the right is a very big silkscreen print. It's a yeah. the sheet is one of those 30 by 40 Somerset sheets. Yeah. No, they're just, I like your work. Thank you. They're beautiful. Thank you, Caroline. I like your work. Um, so this actually gives you an idea of how big the screens are. And actually, this is the little gear that was showing up on that other etching that I just like, I love that gear. And I started looking, thinking about gears. And um, so when I first started doing the really big work, I didn't have screens this big. The biggest screen I had was 23 by 31. And that's the outside measure. So the work, um, everything was broken down into 16 by 20 or 15 by 20. So that shows you modularly, you know, like some of the pieces you'll see are eight foot long and they're made up of 14 different screens. Just um, since Rebecca and I opened the studio in West Newton, we've had these really big screens. So that's made my life much easier. So this is actually an etching. So this one on the right is a silk screen of this image, but this is an etching of this image. So, you know, once I, I, I really agonize over my ideas, but once I have an idea I like, I just beat that sucker up. <laughs> so like, I'm gonna get a lot of mileage. I, I like these cogs for, uh, you know, this part of it is just intuition about why I like it so much. And um, this, so this is a copper plate etching with a overroll of the yellow. So the, the black ink is in the plate, in the in, intaglio of the plate and the yellow is rolled over. And this is, that big silk screen that you saw of the, um, the gears a minute ago, what I did was I silk screened that image onto a piece of paper and I printed it with a transparent material, like it's called transparent base, but it has no color. And then I just scattered um, glitter on the paper. So it's like flocked with iridescent glitter which I, I kind of got in trouble with because I made a big mess in the studio. But it was fun. And again, I think going to museum school is such a breakthrough for me because um, they, they really encourage you to break rules. So no one ever told me you should like silk screen and then put glitter on something. But you know, I felt like, hey, that's kind of cool. You know? So I guess um, the scale, this is one that I did with smaller screens. This is an older image. You can tell by the the pre-COVID uh, brown hair. Um, this is actually four screens. <laughs> so, so, the, so if you kind of divide it up into quadrants, that's how many screens I had to make to make this one image. And now, you know, if you look really carefully, you can sort of really, really, really carefully you can sort of see where the, the screens are pieced together or, or maybe not, I don't know. No. <laughs> um, so as I have become um, more interested in making sculpture, I've been thinking about how to make my prints more sculptural. This is a woodblock print and the, the whole print is on the left, but on the right is a close up to show that I, I cut the woodblock and I printed it, but then I printed it as a silkscreen print, cut out the little petals of these falling flowers and then sewed them on the print. So they're not glued, they're the little threads are, and, the, and they sort of stick up and they have threads. So 
you know, I've been sort of working my way and you'll see how things got very sculptural. So at the same time, I'm actually, I have this whole body of sculpture that I do. This is a piece I did for my thesis show in 2006. So I was making prints, but also making sculpture. And it has the same meaning for me. It really, my father was a hemiplegic. He, he was wounded in World War II. He only had use of one side of his body. And so the split chest of drawers was you know, partially inspired by this. So the furniture became real furniture at the same time that I'm making prints with furniture. And I was also playing with the idea of how can I make sculpture from prints? So this is entirely made of prints. Um, the little birds are a silk screen and inside there's an etching. And actually our, our, our yeah. Oh, no, I was referring back to the, the one that you had. Somebody had asked, um, I appreciate how you address heavy, meaningful subjects. How much do you have to explain yourself versus letting the work speak for itself? Yeah, I mean, I, I do give artist talks, but generally, you know, there's an artist statement and I think the work should speak for itself. And sometimes people come up to me at my shows and say, I know what your work is about. And they tell me, and I think, you know, actually that's really close. You know, there's, I mean, you may not get that from this, but you, you might not get what I just told you from this, but it would be interesting to hear what people have to say about it, not knowing what my content is. But generally people are pretty close. The, the, some things are just technical. Like um, I actually help, got help from my niece who, um, who learned how to make um, shoes at Pratt and I asked her to make me a pattern for a shoe. And then I printed silkscreen and etchings and stuff on the pattern and then pieced together the, the shoe from paper. And, but here um, I am making um, Ferris wheels by printing onto aluminum and to wood and then piecing them together to make a piece of sculpture. So sometimes the printmaking is just an element of a larger piece. And sometimes it's the whole piece like the banner. So, and these, these on the one on the left is an etching at the top and a silk screen on top of it. And the one on the right is just an etching, but I'm showing you this because I'm now showing you this. So I did this big body of work of ladders and this is corrugated cardboard, um, silk screen with an image of a forest and then with threads at the bottom. So I usually, I mean, my work tends to be images of sculptural objects, and then I go back and forth between making sculpture and prints of them. And then, so here's a four color silk screen print. This is quite big. This is, this is something like 60 inches high. And I've Photoshopped the ladders into the forest. And this is, you know, you don't need to know this, but this is the forest in Belgium where my father was wounded. And I was just thinking of how heartbreaking it was to think of these young men walking through the forest and being shot at. So these ladders are supposed to be an imaginary way to get them up out of harm's way. And then here we have um, ladders silk screened onto fabric. So again, I, this is when I only had little screens. So these are nine or 10 or something screens all butted up together. And, and I was going through a time in my life when I was really trying to get perspective, you know, rising above. So the ladders had, and I made staircases. This is a staircase, no printmaking whatsoever, <laughs> but this is a staircase made completely of pillow and blankets and coverlets and sheets, all, all my stuff. Um, I call it Jacob's Ladder. Um, another way of that, this piece and the one you just saw were in the same show and the whole show was staircases and ladders with the idea that, you know, these were imaginary objects that you could sort of rise above crap. <laughs> this is a picture of the, what the gallery looked like. So there was a big staircase in the middle of the gallery that went you know, way up towards the ceiling and 
and out. And the show is called Up and Out. This is more of that body of work. I, I worked on the up and out stuff for several years. And on the left is silk screen again on corrugated. And on the right is the stack of furniture that's part, some of it's printed corrugated. And then across the ceiling was a lot pieces, ladders kind of joined together made of um, translucent paper. No, no printmaking. So I've always been more interested in what the work means um, than how it's made necessarily. Although it's, I mean, it's important for me that it's made beautifully, but um, it's really, I'm trying to, to talk about ideas that I have about, you know, global warming or whatever the things that are particularly bothering me at the time. Um, and then this body of work, well, I was given a traveling fellowship by the museum school and I went to Turkey um, and spent a lot of time looking at prayer rugs. And I, um, when I came back, I made a series of my own prayer rugs. They're sort of atheistic prayer rugs and um, they are all hand um, sewn. And some of them have printmaking on them. Like for instance, you can recognize the bottom left are the same flower petals that you saw earlier. So there's silk screens of little flower petals falling on this part. And um, they're all, all the, each, every rug has quotations on them from various things. Like, I think this is H.L. Mencken's um, The Graveyard of the Gods. And so the bottom left here has silk screens of little birds, but it's all embroidered and um, appliques and little LED lights. This is a close up of one of them. It took me a year to do six pieces. Can I uh, ask a question? Does the print come first or the embroidery? I mean, or does it just all come together in your mind or do you start one? with one or the other? So I wanted to adopt the, the format of a prayer rug. So that came first, the size, the shape, some of the tropes like uh, this kind of doorway shape. And then um, this quote is from the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, the bird of life is singing on the bow. And so those things came first and then because it was the bird of life, I incorporated the bird. So I would say the content of the, the format of the piece comes first. That, that always comes first. I, I know a lot of printmakers think about, I'm going to do an etching, so that comes first. Or they think about the landscape they're going to do or whatever. But um, my work is always about what comes first is the idea. Mm -hmm. um, this is another close up of another one of the prayer rugs. And it, so you can see there's a, a chest of drawers there. And this was more of the images I did when I was working with 3D modeling. So I had all these chests of drawers that I rotated around in space. So I, I so screened the chest of drawers on our old tablecloth and then I embroidered over that. And those, those colorful lines are electrical wires. I was trying to think of a way to move away just from embroidery and incorporate non-traditional materials. So this show, um, we're now about um, 2017, I think, 2018. Um, my father died and um, I was, thinking when I made this work of him and how when I was with him was I was looking out the window at the landscape and I was thinking about um, a group of, of imaginary people sitting around together. These are chairs made completely out of paper. They're cast. So basically what I did was I took um, paper, um, Japanese like rice paper, and I silk screened it. And then I took chairs and I cast the paper over the chairs and then took the chairs out, basically cut out, cut apart the chairs and reassemble them. 
So they're completely, there's no, there's no wire, there's no um, armature, there's nothing underneath the paper and they're suspended. So if I show you the next image, this is actually a video of the show, just to get, give you an idea of the fact that they're suspended. So imagine a circle of people sitting around, family members, people who have passed at the bedside of someone who's dying. And on the wall of the gallery were 27 etchings of my father's shirt in different positions. These paper chairs took me so long to make. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's very beautiful, but haunting too. Well, I mean, it was about what it feels like to be with somebody who's passing. Mm. Am I going too fast? <laughs> okay. Um, so this was also on the wall of that gallery at that particular show. And this is a piece of felt, not a great choice of material, but I, I'm not a textile artist. So sometimes I do things with textiles and I'm, I'm out of my depth. But so what I did was I silk screened an image, the same landscape that was on the behind the paper behind the chairs, and the same landscape that was on the chairs. This is on a piece of felt and I embroidered the whole thing. And again, you can see my my immigrant figures on there. So there's like this, that, that figure is like a self-portrait. So I'm standing on in the landscape, looking out. And this does all sorts of crazy um, embroidery. You can't even see the silkscreen print because I covered it completely with sewing. I, I wish I could do close-ups to show you, but that, that I, you know, didn't think of doing that. It was interesting project. So, um, so after that, I uh, was invited by the Fitchburg Art Museum to participate in a show that they were putting together about local Massachusetts furniture manufacturing. And they called me because they said, "Like you're the chair lady, so <laughs> we want you." And I did this installation. So these pieces are life-size furniture. And I found the furniture in a catalog uh, from one of those Massachusetts uh, furniture companies. So I had a little catalog that was black and white. Um, and I scanned the images from the catalog, you know, little teeny images of furniture. And then I made these screen prints on plywood. So the couch at the bottom is actually eight feet long. And again, I just had little um, screens. So this is 14 screens. You actually can see the, some of this where they meet a little bit on this one. But um, yeah, like right here, you can sort of see a line. Um, but this is where I learned how to take small screens and make them look like big pieces. And um, so they're on plywood, but you can see they're not sitting on the wall. They're held out from the wall with plumbing fixtures. <laughs> so they're out at different de in depths. And this work, um, I'm, repr I'm reprising it in the show that I'm opening next week. So it's on my card. I'm using it as part of an installation about COVID because as I started to think about COVID and how it feels to be quarantined, this work came to mind. So I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about that. But for scale, this, this, is, this shows you how big <laughs> this wall is. I, this, I don't know how many feet it was. It was pretty big. It was really fun. And I like doing this furniture because, um, because it's local Massachusetts furniture, but also it's really ubiquitous. This is like everybody's grandma's furniture. Like there was a time in this country, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing this furniture in somebody's back room, some hotel or something. It just really reminded me of Americana. And the catalog was a, st a stitch because, it, you know, this catalog was talking about how when a man comes home from work, he really has to sit in his man chair and his man cave 
and the little lady has to like find someplace else to sit. So the the chairs with legs with the little ruffly seats, those were her chairs. And the big, big chairs are like his chairs. And this catalog was just so ridiculous. It was so sexist and crazy. And then I look at the back of the catalog and it was dated like 1975. <laughs> I was just like, oh, oh my God. Yeah. So that was I'm mean, horrifying. But anyway, I I, I just, um, I really had fun with this one. And this is what those pieces look like up close. They're, <laughs> they're completely flat. I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Um, so these pieces are completely flat on plywood, but they have this really crazy Trump Lloyd look. And um, so I was, you know, at that point, I'm starting to do Instagram, and a very nice young woman from Kentucky contacted me, and she said, we want you to show that work here in Kentucky. And I said, well, you understand this is plywood. It's really big, and it's really heavy. And, and then I was, and she's got a 60-foot gallery, 60 feet. And I thought, that that's so cool. I, I want to do something with this. So I redid all of the work on fabric. And then I rolled it up, put it in duffel bags and took it with me to Kentucky. So this is just one shot of it, but the next image is, is a video of this installation in Kentucky. What's really cool about this is that I could, since it was on fabric, I could bend it around corners and like put it up on the ceiling. And I'm showing this work again in the show that I'm opening next week with the other work. So bringing together both works. So now you, you know that piece, <laughs> more etchings, little etchings, and then how to fill up a 60 foot gallery with stuff you can just put on the plane. I showed three of the latter two. <laughs> really big, fantastic space. I never set out really to be an installation artist, but um, this sort of happened. <laughs> so that this brings us pretty much to um, where I am today, which is uh, next week, I'm opening a show at the Boston Sculptors Gallery, and I'm bringing together, as I said, the, the work that's the furniture on plywood, the silk screens on plywood, silk screens on fabric, but um, that's all going to be on the walls of the um, gallery. And the middle of the gallery is going to be an installation that for me is the, the really painful part of COVID, which is being apart from family and friends. You know, we were locked down in uh, the early part of COVID without seeing anybody, and it took us right into Thanksgiving. And for me, this was really hard. And I had the sense that everybody really suffered a lot from the isolation, from being away, whether it was Thanksgiving or weddings or bar mitzvahs or births or deaths or whatever, it was tough. And um, so in the middle of the gallery is going to be the Thanksgiving table, but the, thanks the table is not there. And there's nothing real about the dishes. Um, they have, this is cyanotype on a paper mache plate. And um, this is a silk screen of a place setting dishes. And it's just a silk screen print that will be suspended to look like it's on a table, but the, but the table is not there. And these uh, on the left are chairs, but they're just made of wire, um, steel wire. And on the right, is a silk screen print on silk. This is the one where the screen was slipping around. And so those will be, sus will be suspended in the middle of the room like the other suspended chairs, but you know, to give you an idea of a table that's not there, an event that never happened without people, you know, it, for me, it was a really heartbreaking situation because you know, I already miss my parents who have passed and then just not to have, you know, usually I have a big, 
friends giving party, lots of people and all my printmaker friends, all my sculpture friends, everybody comes in, we have a big party and couldn't do it. And it, for me, that was, that was really hard. So this installation is about Thanksgiving that didn't happen. Liz, quick question um, from the chat. Have you, and it seems like this isn't the case, but have you ever been unable to show a vision because of making ability? It seems you have a command of so many different types of materials. Have you ever started over with materials or? <laughs> yeah, almost, you know, actually, I've, because I think a lot about what I'm doing before I do it, sometimes I get a little carried away. And I told the Fitchburg Art Museum that I could do this installation with silk screen on wood. And then when I made the first one, it didn't work. And I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to go back to them and tell them I couldn't do it. But I just figured out another way to do it. So what happened is I, when I first tried to silk screen onto the wood, I painted the wood first with an undercolor with house paint, because why not? And then I silk screened on that. And then the silk screening didn't stick to the house paint Oh my God. So I ended up just trying different kinds of paint. And what I figured out was you should paint the wood with silkscreen ink because silkscreen ink st sticks to silkscreen ink. So, uh, you know, crisis avoided. But I thought I was going to be very embarrassed because I was so self-assured that I could do this thing. <laughs> but, but no, you know, the thing is, if I don't have a skill, like I, I don't, I know how to weld, but I'm not a welder. So I know people who do. So with these steel wire chairs, I did a drawing of exactly what I wanted. As a matter of fact, I did, I did a big silkscreen print to size, a life-size chair in silkscreen, and I handed that off to my friend Dennis Foranos, who, who does work with steel. So I asked him to make those for me. Fortunately, I don't have to do that very often, but I, I had this idea that I wanted these chairs to be completely see-through, and I wanted them to be very skeletal, and it just came to me that I wanted them to be made of steel wire, and I tried to build them out of some steel wire and I knew that was gonna be a disaster. So I just went to Dennis and said, here, could you please weld these for me? And as a sculptor, you know, you learn to do that all the time. You, you, can't, you can't do everything. So, um, and as printmaker, I mean, in the whole history of printmaking is people working with apprentices. So, you, you know, the fact that I do all my printing on my own is only the occasional use of someone to help me um, is, that's a little unusual because most people, especially who work big, you know, have a lot of help. Liz? Yeah? Hi. So thank you for sharing that tid tidbit of how you made the chairs because I was thinking you are the master of all. Like it's kind of <laughs> unbelievable to see all the different modes that you've used and, and just everything, it seems like you have figured out everything. I just want to also, um, I, and I love, I love your work. And you were, I believe, the graduate assistant to Peter Scott when I had taken, a, like, it must have been 2005 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And to see where your work has gone. And I remember you showing us that first chair um, uh, print that it was from a coloring book. And I was wondering, so when I first looked at that, I thought you had drawn all of those. And I'm interested, like being the age that I am, around the use of technology in work and, you know, coming from being in my late 60s and coming from a place where everything was done by hand. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that and also about, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on the appropriation of images. You know, um, because I'm the same age, you know, I came at this like, if I don't make every little thing with my own hands, is it really okay? But it's really, it's really okay. <laughs> uh, we live in a postmodern environment and I think it actually ages us as artists to make everything, it, it, there's that crafty, you know, yeah. lady thing where everything is very crafty and it, it takes a certain amount because I was a 70s feminist, I thought I will never embroider because that's a woman's thing. But, you know, now we've come full circle. So I can, I can take any material, any kind of work and use it and put it to good use. And um, yeah, I think, 
appropriation is swell and I think it's how you do it and and also you know don't forget that old adage you know if you're going to appropriate something you have to change it twice mm -hmm. take it change it and make sure that it's copyright free <laughs> you appropriate it change it and change it again yeah thank so, you yeah it's I think for me that's really liberated me as an artist that I don't have to draw everything and don't forget you know lots of times I end up drawing it anyway like I find something, but then I have to scan it and redraw it, at least trace it, but most of the time redraw it. Mm -hmm. So it starts with some something else that I've found that's very insignificant, like the coloring book, you know. Yeah. Thank you. I love your work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just see what else I have. Oh, so these are just more paper mache objects that will be in this show. And um I'm having fun as I come, you know, the last days of preparing, making objects, cutting them up. This is sort of like that chest of drawers, you know, where it's, this is cyanotype and silkscreen. The inside is cyanotype, the outside is silkscreen. It's cast, mm -hmm. cast paper. And this is strictly cyanotype. And I, I owe my sister-in-law a, a big, um, there, she's there, hello. Um, a big thanks because I was trying to figure out how to uh, basically make my own Dutch master painting uh, it, as a cyanotype. And so I'm not a photographer. So, so I, I mean, we, you were asking about like, do I ever get a situation where I can't do something? I, this happens all the time. I mean, I get an idea to do something. And I think, how am I going to do this? I'm not a photographer, but fortunately my sister-in-law is a photographer. So I said, okay, I want to take a photograph um, and I want it to look like a Dutch painting. I want it because the idea behind my show is this absence of Thanksgiving. And then on one wall, I have the presence of what I really want, which is all of that lusciousness and the bounty and the you know, generosity of Thanksgiving. So I wanted to have this, this image of what Thanksgiving should be, you know, like over the top. And, um, and so she talked me through, okay, you know, this is how you need to set it up. And a friend, another friend of mine, I, I actually did this a few times and a friend of mine artist looked at this and said, it's not over the top enough. If you want it to look like a Dutch painting, you gotta throw more stuff in there. So I got like the dead fish and I got the melon and I've got the, the lemons and the grapes and the flowers and the silver and, and, and it's loaded with family objects because, you know, Thanksgiving, usually you get out all the family objects. And so learning cyanotype from another friend who is a cyanotype specialist. I mean, I, it does drive me crazy that every time I get an idea, I have to learn a new skill, but you know, it, it keeps it interesting. And this is the um, four color silkscreen version of that cyanotype image. I'm not sure if that's the last image. Oh yeah. So um, I'm happy to take whatever questions you have. We missed something in the chat. Um, I had a, a question. I, I'll try to say it simply. I, I like the way that you work with concepts and series that you're, there's something that you're wanting to relate and you work it out. How do you know when you've finished, when you come, <laughs> when you, you know, it's like, it's time to move on. You've said what you've wanted to say. And then also, do you ever go back and revisit themes? I noticed, I'm thinking of the immigrant with a bag of that there's times where suddenly that you feel compelled to work with that resource again. Yeah, sometimes it's by invitation. So for instance, um, you know, when I was invited to go to Kentucky to show that work and I did, couldn't travel with the big stuff, I had to then rethink it. And I'm super excited when somebody comes to me and says, we want you to be in this show. This is what the theme is. And I'm like, cool. And that sometimes can launch me in a whole different direction. Or sometimes they come to me with something and they say, well, this is sort of up your alley. And then I think, well, what else can I do with it? Because um, I'm kind of bored with doing the same thing over and over again. I'm thinking about, but how do I know when I'm done? I would say if I'm making something and I'm not super engaged and excited, then I'll just put it aside. And, and that happens. Like I'll start something and I'll be like, yeah, I I'm, I'm, don't want to do, I don't, I don't feel like working on this and put it aside. There's so much content out there. I mean, I've never done a body of work about global warming, but that certainly could be next. 
you know, COVID was something that was, um, I mean, I may be work, making work about isolation and COVID and, and loneliness and quarantine. I mean, that's just, who knows how long I'll be working on that. That's a tough one. Any other? Again, feel free to ask your questions in the chat if you want. I, I can ask a question, if that's okay. So I thought it, it was interesting to look at your all of your work. And there's a lot of things that are up off the ground, like the up and out and the waiting and now this current thing. So I was just kind of wondering if you could speak about that, <clears throat> if you have any thoughts. I mean, it's yeah. kind of cool that that keeps reappearing, but let, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, it's, it's cool, but it's also not cool because I have to keep figuring out how to suspend things. And that's a <laughs> pain in the ass. <laughs> it's real. This show that I'm installing for next week, it's all suspended. No, not all of it. It's, yeah, it's all suspended. And it's a real big pain in the ass to figure out how to make that damn gravity. It's a pain <laughs> in the butt. But I get this idea that, you know, this table and everything has to be floating because it's not real. And um, I think too, part of it is that I grew up listening to um, Alice in Wonderland on, mm -hmm. um, on tape, on actually on a record. And the falling through the rabbit hole and that really took my brain when I was little. And um, there's a lot of uh, dream images or fantasy images. And I wish it was simpler, but it just seems like every show is suspended. And I, I'm always trying not to do that. I think, oh, I got this idea, but it's suspended again. No, I think it's, I think that it's a, a nice thing that you repeat that. Um, I just think it's, I just think it's inter, it's cool. That's all. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad it's cool, but um, it would be nice to, to make things that sit on. Actually, you know, the paper chairs ended up being suspended for a reason. Because I made the paper chairs and people kept saying, oh, can you sit on it? Mm. And I think oh. if somebody sits on one of these chairs, they're going to break them. You know, they're going to, they're made of paper. <laughs> Do I really need to tell you that you can't sit on it? But I actually have another paper chair in this exhibit too coming up and and it's going to be suspended because people come to shows and they're tired and they want to sit down. They're not thinking. They're going to sit down on a chair and that's going to ruin it. So, and hurt them. So, yeah, that's how they got suspended. A, a friend of mine showed up to install a show at the Boston Sculptors Gallery. She came on her bicycle and the whole show was in her knapsack because it was made of little silk pieces. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I don't want to have to rent a truck and get rigging and ladders and all this stuff, but it's so far I haven't figured out how to do it. Um, someone asked, can we sit on the wire chairs? <laughs> they're, they're completely flat. <laughs> they're, oh. <laughs> they're, they're, there's nothing to sit on. They look three-dimensional, but they're, they're flat. Yeah. I, I was thought someone was gonna say like, well, do you sell any of this useless stuff? <laughs> no, I don't sell any of the useless stuff. I, you know, I keep making two-dimensional prints with the hope that they will fund the things that are completely useless. But um, yeah, it's just installation work. There any other, anything else? Um, somebody said, but why not sell bits of the installation? Oh, yeah. I mean, anybody who wants an eight foot couch, be my guest. <laughs> no, you know, no, I'm, I don't think of them as like one piece. So obviously, they're, the, all these things are made up of lots of pieces. So if somebody comes along and wants a part of something, I'm very happy to sell it. Yeah, I was thinking those chairs would look just cool individually on a wall, but sticking out. They're yeah. just 
because again, they're iconic. I mean, I think we've all had a, a grandparents, grandmother sit in one of those chairs with the, the ruffles. It's, it's just lovely. Yeah, yeah. And some of them, the colors were um, selected to go with the time period that they, the chairs were manufactured. So like you'll see that kind of butterscotch yellow and mm. brown love seat that was like, you remember what that feels like to sit on that thing? It was so scratchy. So um, I paid a lot of attention to the way I printed them. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, someone contacted me, someone saw work on the Instagram and they said, oh my God, now I figured out what to hang over the couch, a couch. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I did have an interesting and maybe it doesn't matter anymore and, and as I kind of after attending Carolyn's talk and yours I'm getting that feeling now because at first I said well when you did the couches on on um, cloth does that become a print where the other ones since they're outside the wall are sculpture but maybe those are not useful terms anymore yeah, I mean, three-dimensional printmaking is something that I think is fairly new, you know, that that people take prints and make them into sculpture. I don't know when people start. I mean, I I um, think a lot about um, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking out, but uh, Carolyn, can you, you know who I'm talking about with the bed? He did the bed and then uh, uh, darn it. I'm sorry, I'm blanking out, but um, we're talking oh, about. Sorry? Even if you go, even if you go way back, think of prints as the becoming books, pop-up books, et cetera. Printmaking is often used as a source material to create other things. And many artists now in contemporary times are using it to, as the building blocks as the either the starting point or the ending point in order to create another piece so it doesn't become as categorized things yeah. the divisions between media have really broken down and it can move back and forth and artists can move back and forth as their creativity suits them and i i, I was trying to think of rauschenberg you're right dora um at Dora uh, Rauschenberg has always been a big influence for me. And, um, you know, is it, when is it sculpture? You know, uh, Claude Oldenburg. Uh, mm -hmm. Oldenburg did this series of, uh, of work with corrugated cardboard. And I was really inspired by that. I mean, it's obviously sculpture. It's not printed cardboard. But, um, you know, if I see something like paper or cardboard, I want to print on it. And that actually gives me another way to express myself so it's not just, you know, so it takes, it makes it mine. I'm always looking for a way to take it, make it mine. So if I see something like Klaus Oldenburg's corrugated cardboard bathroom that he made, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, I love this idea. How am I gonna make it mine? It's partly gonna be probably printmaking. Um, the, we have a question. How do you feel when you complete a project? I mean, I love showing my work and um, I love talking about my work. <laughs> I love giving the artist talk. I love the opening. I'm not an artist who's happy to make work and then just sort of sit at home. And <laughs> that's not the, I, I, I'm, I feel excited about making the work, but um, I need people to see it. And that's, that's part of, for me, what's made COVID so hard is that I, I realize how much I need people. And so for me, this opening that I'm having is a very joyful thing. And, um, and I'm already starting with, <laughs> I have new work in, in process. It, what happens often with us is that we get a whole show together, but we don't stop making work, you know, when the show is finished to go, and it goes up, we're, we're already engaged in the next thing. So I have another piece that I'm doing that's for next summer that I'm thoroughly engaged in, I'm very excited about. And, um, this often happens when the work is done, you're, you sort of move along and then you have to go back and talk about the older work. Um, I'm, I'm lucky that I've, I've you know, had a lot going on. Well, I wanna thank you for joining us this evening and everyone who did. Um, I also wanna invite anyone who's here to um, see, um, 
more work um, here at our in our galleries. If you don't know, um, there's a lot of people I think online who don't know that the Malden Public Library has the Converse galleries. There are five galleries of art and um, exhibits. So um, come see our work as well. And, um, and hopefully um, you'll keep in touch. So we have more, hopefully more artist talks coming. I think it's really wonderful when we can see work and see how it, the thought processes that have gone into making the work. So we really wanna thank Liz for her time this evening and Carolyn for her time last week. And um, and anything, uh, you wanna say when, where, when show, um, the show that when people can see it? Yeah, Boston Sculptors Gallery, 486 Harrison Avenue in Silwa in the South End. Uh, the gallery is open Wednesday through Sunday, 11 to five. And it will be coming down, it will go up uh, next Wednesday and to come down Halloween. It's easy to remember. I will be in the gallery first Friday, this uh, next Friday, week from this Friday. And um, I'll be periodically um, gallery sitting and I, I post those on Instagram, but um, yeah, come and see me when I'm there. Um, if you don't wanna go to first Friday opening because you're concerned about too many people um, come other times. And I'm also there by appointment as well, so. You can always email me, liz at lizshepherd.com, and um, I'll meet you at the gallery. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. In the chats, lots of thank you, Liz. I know Liz can't see thank the you. but lots of lethal thank you. Thank you very much. Time for dinner. <laughs> See ya. Uh...